March 18, 1938 was an eventful day in the world of oil. Mexico nationalized its oil industry, setting a precedent for nationalizations around the world afterward. Uh, the Standard Oil Company of California, today known as Chevron, completed the first discovery in Saudi Arabia, the greatest oil find of all time, and on that very same day, the first production of offshore oil came in in the Gulf of Mexico. Beginning in the 1890s, oil companies had drilled wells in the ocean, but from wooden piers connected to shore, such as the ones constructed at Summerlin, California, near Santa Barbara. In 1937, two independent firms, Pure Oil and Superior Oil, finally plunged away from the shoreline to build the first freestanding structure in the ocean. It was in 14 feet of water, a mile and a half from Louisiana's coast. On March 18, 1938, this structure brought in the first well from what was named the Creole Field. The Creole platform severed oil extraction from land, and it did so profitably setting in motion the march of innovation into ever deeper waters and new geological environments offshore. After World War II, oil companies equipped shrimp boats with seismic equipment and then built special seismic vessels to acquire geophysical data that led them to promising areas to drill. In 1947, Kermagee Oil Industries drilled the first productive well out of sight of land on a platform located in 18 feet of water ten and a half miles off Louisiana's Terrebonne Parish. The Kermac 16 platform used a war surplus tender barge to house drilling mud and other supplies, plus the workers' quarters. After the political and legal settlement of the Tidelands dispute between the states and the federal government, awarding federal control generally beyond three miles off the coast, the industry found ways to achieve mobility in drilling. In 1954, the Offshore Drilling and Exploration Company launched its Mr. Charlie Submersible Drilling Barge, which sat on the bottom in 30 feet of water for drilling and then could be refloated and moved to other locations, like a bee moving from flower to flower to extract nectar. Other companies experimented with jack-up rigs, such as Glasscock Drilling's Mr. Gus. These rigs jacked their platforms out of the water by extending a series of cylindrical or truss-type legs to the bottom, taking drilling into water depths exceeding 100 feet. During the 1950s, offshore drilling in the Gulf was astoundingly successful, much more than onshore. In 1956, 26% of offshore exploratory wells struck oil and gas, compared to just 11% onshore. Once a discovery was made, Platforms affixed atop latticed steel jacket structures were installed to produce oil and gas. Pipelines were laid to bring the hydrocarbons to shore. Divers provided vital support to underwater operations. Helicopters were introduced to ferry workers to platforms by air. By 1957, there were more than 400 production platforms in federal and state waters. Texas and Louisiana offshore accounted for about 200,000 barrels a day. This was only 3% of total U.S. domestic production, but that percentage was on the rise. In 1960 and 1962, the federal government accelerated offshore exploration by auctioning off large amounts of acreage in the Gulf. In March 1962, two million acres were leased, more than in all previous auctions combined. At the same time, the industry dramatically extended its depth capabilities after Shell Oil unveiled the Blue Water One the first semi-submersible drilling vessel, which enabled drilling from a floating position in water deeper than 300 feet. Offshore drilling in the 1960s set off one of the greatest industrial booms the Gulf Coast had ever seen. Workers flocked from around the region to take high-paying jobs offshore or in the growing onshore support centers. Technological innovation in all phases of offshore exploration and production, from digital recording and processing of seismic data to new well designs and well logging techniques, to the use of larger equipment and stronger steel in platform construction, fueled the continuing boom and generated interest in basins off other U.S. coasts and in places like the North Sea. By the end of the 1960s, production platforms gradually inched out into nearly 400-foot depths. The drilling of shallow cores in ultra-deep water, such as that conducted on the famous voyage of the Glomar Challenger drill ship, gave evidence that oil had been generated in extreme ocean depths and beckoned oil explorers further from land. 
By the end of the 1960s, however, the offshore industry in the Gulf was facing some serious problems. The cost of bringing in oil began to outrun the price of oil. Hurricanes swept into the Gulf several times and wreaked havoc on platforms and pipelines. Time pressures and technological challenges compromised safety. Blowouts, helicopter crashes, diving accidents, and routine injuries were all too common for the industry in the Gulf. Federal oversight of the offshore industry was lax. By 1969, there were only 12 people overseeing 1,500 platforms in the Gulf. This collective inattention to safety made the industry ripe for disaster. On January 28, 1969, that disaster came in the form of a well blowout on a Union Oil Company platform in the Santa Barbara Channel, releasing an 800 square mile slick of oil that blackened an estimated 30 miles of California beaches and lethally soaked thousands of birds in the dewy mess. The Santa Barbara blowout set the stage for the National Environmental Policy Act and the passage of other landmark environmental legislation. It forever tied the American environmental movement to offshore oil. The following year, two other major explosions and spills on platforms in the Gulf underscored the need for dramatic changes to ensure safety and environmental protection in offshore oil operations. In the aftermath of these disasters, the federal government expanded and strengthened regulations. Meanwhile, the industry responded to the wake-up call and improved designs, equipment, and operating practices, and thereby achieved a new level of safety. 